Okay, so the telencephalon is going to expand. In particular, the dorsal telencephalon, which is the source of cerebral cortex, is going to expand. Why? Because we're not alligators. Here's an alligator and its ferns. And what, what do alligators do? They have a prime directive, find food, eat it, find more food and eat it again. So open jaws, close jaws, on we go. We're eating stuff. There's, there's just not a whole uh, variety of behavioral repertoire. There's not a lot of flexibility. That's not who we are. So in order to, sur to support the relative in relatively limited behavioral repertoire of alligators and other um, uh, aquatic animals, including the garfish, what you see here is, uh, this is taken from the Museum of Comparative Anatomy and Paleontology in Paris. It's a, it's a great museum. And this is a garfish, an aguila is a garfish. And uh, you have a spinal cord, and then there's a hindbrain, a midbrain, and this is the telencephalon. Just this piece right here is the telencephalon. So it, it, it looked just like that chain of vesicles that we already looked at. Everything's all lined up, very well behaved. Not so much in us. So we don't have that. In particular, we have this huge expansion of cerebral cortex. And the, the cerebral cortex that we have is just, um, cerebral cortex means a, a bark, a cortex means bark. And so it's that outer mantle or outer rind of the telencephalon. And it's just the flat, last uh, few millimeters that, perf that uh, constitute the cerebral cortex. And so this surface area is, is enormous. And in fact, the surface area of the cerebral cortex is enough to, to make a, a, a large pizza. Okay, so a large pizza, we gotta fold that large pizza up and somehow and get it into our cranium. That's the goal. That's what we're gonna get, that's what we're gonna do here. So how does that, um, and, and what you can see is that if we, unlike the uh, gar, where you look down, you see the telencephalon, you see the midbrain, you see the hindbrain, you see the spinal cord, here, all you see is telencephalon. It's come back, it's combed over, so it's covering everything else. From the side, all you see is a little bit of hindbrain. You see the cerebellum, that's it. You don't see any of the diencephalon. You don't see any of the midbrain. You don't see very much of the, of the uh, hindbrain what you see is telencephalon, that's it. So how do we get to this situation? How, is this, how does this occur? So here's where we left off. We had a rhomencephalon, which is gonna become the hindbrain, the pons medulla and, and cerebellum. The mesencephalon is gonna become the midbrain. Diencephalon is gonna become the thalamus and hypothalamus. Telencephalon splits into two hemispheres. Here's the lamina terminalis. These hemispheres, each of these hemispheres is now going to expand in every possible directions, forwards, down, out, back, to, to the midline. And so in short order, it starts to cover, it, it's expanding back, it's covering now the diencephalon and the mesencephalon. A little bit later, still in gestation, now it's covered this and now it still doesn't have enough room. So what does it do? It throws out an extra piece as the temporal lobe. This is essentially a ram's horn of extra territory for the cerebral cortex. It wasn't enough just to cover this way. We gotta throw it out and create this extra chunk here that is called the temporal lobe. From the side, what you can see is that this, uh, the, the telencephalic hemisphere has grown down, it's grown forward, and that's, okay, that's your first hint as to how this lamina terminalis is gonna become not the front end, but deep to the front end, because the telencephalic hemisphere is growing forward. It's also growing back, and then it's gonna circle around. So in the end, what you have is that it's covering most of the rest of the brain, with a little bit of exception, this back end, which is gonna become the cerebellum. 
and here's the here's the uh, lamina terminalis deep within that tube. Okay. Now, if we take a cross section through this developing brain, that a mid sagittal section right down the center, like this. This is what we would see. We'd see the telencephalic hemisphere sitting on top of the diencephalon, mesencephalon, and, ra ra and uh, romencephalon. And right up here, above the mesencephalon and diencephalon, is, there's a comb over. And this area that I've uh, cross-hatched in red, that area is not part of, of the brain. It's, it's not... It's outside of the, of the blood-brain barrier. It's inside the cranium, but it's outside of the blood-brain barrier. It's outside of the brain. You couldn't, take a, you couldn't be a neuron that sat here and say, oh, I'm going to go as the, as, the, as the crow flies. I'm going to go just directly down to the diencephalon. It's not connected that way. There is no traversing this no man's land. So instead, you'd have to come back around and through. And that's, that is indeed what happens. So this is outside. It's just not part of the brain. It's, it's covered by the um, comb over. And in, turn, in fact, this area is a place that's called the vellum interpositum. I will, I will write that for you on the board. So the vellum interpositum has as its floor, it has the, uh, the top of the diencephalon, the roof of the thalamus. And as its ceiling, it has the floor of the telencephalon. And the back end is a place in the midbrain uh, which has the pineal gland. So the back end is the pineal gland. And the front end is um, close to the lamina terminalis. So that little space is outside of the brain. Now, there's no extra room in the cranium. Or, or, this is not gonna, it's not gonna be empty. So what happens? There's all this, these blood vessels that are packed into there. So in the vellum interpositum, lots of blood vessels. And what that means is that those blood vessels can burst and they can, um, uh, they can bleed. And when they do, they increase pressure sort of from the inside of the brain from inside, they blow it up, although they're not within the brain. So they're increasing the intracranial pressure in the cranium, um, and they can also block CSF flow. And we'll look at that. I, I know that doesn't make sense to you right now, but um, we will look at that in detail. And so these vellum interpositum bleeds are very dangerous because they can um, lead to uh, the problems associated with intracranial elevated intracranial pressure, and they can also lead to hydrocephalus. Okay. Um, so now I, let's, let's just make sure that we understand what this looks like in a, an adult. This is, this is exactly, this is that mid-sagittal section that I was talking about. We have the telencephalon, and it has different lobes, the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the temporal lobe. Remember, that's coming around from the back. Um, this is all telencephalon. Here's the diencephalon. Here's the midbrain. This is the diencephalon here. Here's the midbrain. And here's the hindbrain, the pons, medulla, and cerebellum. This area in here, and you can see the pineal gland, this area in here is the vellum interpositum. The final, the final way that we increase surface area for the, uh, for the cerebral cortex is we, we can't expand it anymore. We filled the cranium. What we can do, though, is in the same volume, we can increase surface area. And the way that is done is through gyrification. And so these, uh, these sulci and gyri, sulci are the valleys, gyri are the hills. This invagination and outpouching of the, of the telencephalon produces more surface area, which means that there's more, um, uh, there's more area for, for the cerebral cortex. In fact, only about a third of the cerebral cortex is on the surface of the gyri. Most two-thirds of the cerebral cortex is down deep. 
um, below, below the surface of the brain. Okay, so what we're gonna do next is we're gonna look at the inside, that, that uh, tube has to have a, a, a lumen, a, a hole, and we're gonna look at that um, lumen from the back to the front end. <laughs>